welcome to the Reality Revolution. Been doing a lot of episodes lately on Neville Goddard, and I will continue. He has some really wonderful lectures that I love to do deep dives on. If you've checked out previous episodes, I have about five or six now that I've done and a couple meditations. Uh, I continue to learn new techniques and new ideas from Neville's teachings, and I'd love to share it with you. This particular lecture is called The Art of Dying. He delivered this on March 23rd, 1959, and there's a lot of infinite wisdom in this in understanding what death means and there's some interesting interpretations of some ideas spiritually that are in this and love to know what you think he begins by saying if you are with us for the first time this is what we believe and teach here we firmly believe that you the individual can realize your dream And the reason is that God and man are one. We believe that the difference is not in the mentality with which we operate, but only in the degrees of intensity of the operant power itself. And that we call human imagination. Keats said, you can take any one great and spiritual passage and it will serve as a starting point to lead you to the two and thirty palaces. Take this simple one in Paul's letters to Corinthians, I die daily. Or Blake's statement in his letter to Crab Robinson, death is the best thing in life. There's nothing in life like death, but people take such a long time in dying. At least their neighbors never see them rise from the grave. If you understood Blake, you would not think of death as the world thinks of death, but you would see that no one grew without outgrowing. But man is not willing to outgrow and yet he wants other things than those he has. But if you remain in one state, you will forever have to suffer the consequences of not being in another state. If I remain in the state of poverty, I must suffer the consequences of not being in the state of wealth. So I must learn the art of dying. Paul says, I die daily. Blake says people take such a long time in dying. Man does not outgrow his state of ill health or his old job or his environment. We must learn the art of dying. And this week is the great death. And we are told that God dies that many may live. We say that the imagination of God and man are one, no matter how far it goes. Universes are created and sustained by the same power that sustains our environment. We say the power is the same, but we recognize a vast difference between the power that sustains the universe and that which sustains an environment. The difference is only in the degree of intensity of the center of imagining. So if we increase the intensity in the center of imagining, we will create greater and greater things. So I see my dream and I must learn to die to to what I am in order to live to what I want to be. Now, this is the mystical meaning of a death in the Bible. The death of Moses, a story familiar to all of us. We are told that Moses comes out of the land of Moab, Deuteronomy 34, and then scales the mountain of Nebo, goes to Pisgah, sees Gilead, and finally he looks into the promised land of Jericho. But the Lord tells him, I will let you see the land but you cannot go into it. And then Moses dies 
The present state cannot be carried into the new. It has to die as a consequence of the new made alive. But his eye was not dim and his natural force was not abated. And no one knows his burial place. First, remember that all the characters of the Bible take place in the mind of man. I am Moses, you are Moses. It means to lift up or to draw of, to draw out of. We are told in the very beginning of the story that he was pulled from the bulrushes. The word Moses in Hebrew is Moshe, spelled backwards in the ancient Hebrew means the name Hashem or I am. So I am drawing out of my own being or the I am. Moses comes from Moab. This comes from the two Hebrew words meaning mother, father, or womb. Then he scales the Mount of Nebo, which means to prophecy, or which represents the subjective state I long for. I will prophecy for you or you for another. You single out a person's longing. If he longs for something, it means that he does not have it, else there could be no longing. But Moses climbs Nebo, that is, he participates in seeing the state longed for. I single out something that implies I am the man I want to be. I scale the mountain. Then comes Pisgah, which means to contemplate. I contemplate what I want to be. Then he sees Jericho, which means a fragrant odor. I will contemplate the desired state until I get the feeling or reaction that satisfies. I have not only scaled Nebo, but I have reached Pisgah and I looked into Jericho. I am fulfilled with the emotion that implies the act is completed. Then there is Gilead, which means hills of witnesses. Then I, as Moses, die. I cannot go into the promised land and no one can find where I am buried. What does that, what does it mean? If I am poverty ridden and frightened and then you meet me and see me as free as a bird and happy, then I am not the man you knew who was frightened. Then where is the other man buried? For Moses is the power in man, generic man, male, female, to draw out of himself anything in this world he desires and so enact the drama that he dies to what he was, that he may live to what he is enacting. That is Moses and no one can know where he is buried. But we are told his eye was not dime nor his natural force abated. That is to say, when I die, that is when I enact the drama. I do not wait for signs to appear. It is when I am most aware of my restrictions and feel pressures. Then is when I must learn to die. I must learn to go, to let go of what my senses dictate and go mad and yield to what is only a dream, but sustaining it and living in it. I die to what was physically real as a gradual lift up. What was only the dream. You knew only the frightened man and not the other one. No one can tell where the other one is gone. To me, this really is all about an identity shift in what he is saying so far. If you've been triggered by all the biblical phrases, don't worry about it. He's using those as examples. And the idea is for you to, to see what you're and accomplish what you're doing. You have to change your identity and there's your identity that you're holding on to that is creating the environment that you're in right now dies for you to become something else you have to let something go for there's something that you are holding on to some part of your current situation that is holding on to your manifestations and he says he mentions here in particular he's most aware of my restrictions and, and feel the pressures So when you become aware of those things, that's when you can let those parts of you go that you don't need to worry about those restrictions and pressures. And he then says to go mad, meaning don't worry about what everybody thinks and follow. Let yourself go and follow and become something else. So this is how the art of drawing is dying is dramatized in the Bible as the death of a man. But it has nothing to do with 
any certain man, for the story of the Bible takes place in the mind of every man. I will crucify myself, for God crucified himself in me that I might live. But now I must nail myself upon the thing I desire, and, remaining faithful to it, lift it up as God nailed himself upon me. The present body is believing himself a man called Neville, giving Neville the same power that is his, but keyed low in the hope that I will lift up the power to bigger things in my world to which I can nail myself and so lift them up. There is no possibility of man making his dream alive unless he nails himself to this cross that is man. We are living because God nailed himself to us. Now, man, keyed low, yielding to other states and not to what the senses dictate, becomes one with the state and nails himself to it, fixes himself in the state through emotion and feeling, and then he will be lifted up. So, when God chooses to forget and incarnate as a human being multiple times, that's the death he's talking about. The forgetting that God goes through to become us. That's what he is referring to. For crucifixion comes before resurrection. Crucifixion without resurrection would be unthinkable. It would be the utter triumph of tyranny. If I could yield myself to my dream and it would not become flesh, it would be completely tyranny over this wonderful concept of life. But you cannot fail if you yield. If you hold back within yourself, wonder, what will I play as my last card if this doesn't work? And you have not yielded. You have not nailed yourself to it. It is complete yielding. It is the great cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you know that your God doing it, you can yield. But there must be complete abandonment as though it were true and then you make it a reality you don't think twice about it when you manifest something you act like it's you abandon any doubt the cost is that form of mental abandonment that blake calls madness but man is afraid he dare not so abandon himself to a dream and so never dies so blake was right when he said there is nothing like death the best thing in life is death. Many people only age, but never change inwardly. They only mature physically, but they have not died in the mystical sense. There is no transforming power in the physical death. And they will still be anchored in a larger world with all the trends of this world. To our senses, they seem to be dead but they will still, on another plane, have to learn the art of dying. I can anywhere so detach myself from what is taking place that I can die to that state. So every little death is the lifting of the divine image. This means dying as the mystic means it. It means dying mentally. Man dies to ill health or poverty or to disharmony, but he does it by yielding to other states. Blake looks on all states as permanent as in his great poem regarding the halls of loss. I cursed the earth for man and made it permanent. So states remain and man passes through states as through cities. If I do not pass through some state, but remain in it, I think it is the only reality you cannot conceive of a state that is not for the whole is finished. But man is awakening only by dying to state after state. You take a friend who is not well or cannot set himself free from some state. You represent that friend to yourself as he should be seen by the whole world. And to the degree that you are faithful to that representation, to that degree you will bring him out of the old state. It does not matter if he knows you did it or not. He does not have to know. But remain faithful and you will bring him out of the old state into the new state that you are seeing. 
all things are burned up when we cease to behold them. Moses could see the promised land, but he could not go into it. If I'm true to the likeness of what I behold, then I, the old man, cannot go into the new state. Something called the power goes into it, but no one recognizes it, for they cannot recognize the transformed being. We all feel so secure in recurrence if we know that a thing is fixed and that next thing will be as they are today. I feel secure in that recurrence. I can have done something that violates the moral codes. I can have come from the wrong side of the tracks. But I can accept that, for I am used to it. But to say that something awakes in me and can become what it will, that is frightening to man. So we are told to awake out of sleep, for recurrence brings security to the whole vast world. One does not does what he does as if he did it in a nightmare, for God had to forget he was God to become man. And that whittling down to this level is the very limit of contraction. But then comes the awakening from that deep dream into which he threw himself to make me alive. So this lifting up power goes about setting men free. For God became every man, that every man may in time awaken as God. Eventually the whole world will awaken, and the poem will be in full bloom, and it will be noble beyond our wildest dreams, and then it will exist for us, and we will be one with the creator of the great poem. That is the art of dying. Next Sunday is the great drama. I am riding a beast and I am the crossroads. Bring me a colt on which no man ever sat that is tied by the road where two ways meet. Here is a state I have never ridden before. It is so unnatural to feel myself to be the man I want to be and to actually get into that state and ride it without being thrown by reason which tells me I am made. But if you know the Lord is your imagination, you can ride it into Jerusalem. We are told we will find the animal at a crossroads where two roads meet. We're always at a crossroads of what I am and what I want to be. So can I ride the beast I find at the crossroads and ride it into Jerusalem? Then I am going toward heaven. But it is not continuous on my line of motion. It is contiguous. It is adjacent to where I am, for heaven is a state of consciousness. I try to catch the feeling that would be mine if I were the man I want to be. But that involves a death. I must abandon myself to my dreams as if it were true and living in it I lift it up and make it real everyone must pass through this state for this is the only true religion in the world religion like charity begins at home with oneself the mother seed of all religious belief lies in the mystical experiences of the individual all ceremonies are but secondary growths superimposed upon it. Religion means to be tied or devoted to, but if I am not in love with what I am tied to, I must yield to something more lovely and make it real. I must bear my cross. I go so far and then I want to cross to the other line where my heaven is. For everything is interrelated. We all interpenetrate each other. We are all one. So there is interpretation of the whole world. And then comes conflict. And from that comes the solution of the conflict. For we must conflict if we are all interpenetrated. But then we must bring about reconciliation. Whatever the solution is, 
That is the reconciliation. But we cannot stay in a state or any condition forever. Each new state bears within it the seeds of a new conflict. Every heaven becomes in time hell. A thing is ours for a moment, but as we continue in it, it will bring about conflict. As long as there is in interpenetration, there is always conflict. So live in any desired state, and then as conflict arises, resolve it and die to it, and then move into another state. Thus we grow and outgrow. Thus man awakes. No man can be born in one environment and ever realize another if he does not yield to the state desired. So Blake was right. The best thing in life is death, but it takes man so long to die that his friends never see him rise from the grave. Can you not see, then, how it is with your friend who always tells you the same things? Even though you have not seen him for ten years, everything is still recurring. Nothing is new, but that makes him feel secure. Man does not want to change. It frightens him. And Neville is reminding us here, if we do the same things every day, how can we expect different results? If we are doing the same recurring things, the word recurring has occurred multiple times. Does your days feel like the same every day? Make them anomalous and change them up. You have to change who you are now. That recurring part of, of you needs to die. I tell you that your imagination is God. Believe it. Exercise it. It is keyed low. When, I, when he says that, I'm saying, he's saying that we, it's not obviously super powerful. But as you lift it up, you intensify it. And then vision after vision will be yours as you begin to awake. Do not think you are greedy because you are demanding things or the changing of things. How many times do we meet people that feel guilty that they're being greedy because they want that car or that new house? You are here to create as your father creates. Want what you want and yield to it and create it. Then you will want higher and higher things. But nothing blesses a man unless it comes down from its heavenly state and takes on flesh. You are the only one who can clothe it in reality, but it remains a state unless you yield to it. This drama in the Bible is all about you. For the Christ Jesus of the Gospels is your own wonderful imagination. There's only an infinite God and the creation he loved, and he so loved it, he wanted to make it alive and then share it and even change it. So God became man, that man may become God. That is the great story of the Gospels. Every mystic in the world tells the same story. Then every, free, every man is free. There is no judgment, for no matter what man has done, it is God's doing it in a nightmare. There is only complete forgiveness of sin, no judgment, and no argument, but man can change facts. The past can be unmade. So a man has done this or that, use your strange imagination and turn the great wheel backward and Troy until Troy unburns. And that means to revise. Here we go with one of the more common ideas that Neville always talks about is revision. Going back through your days and changing your past. And in many ways he's implying to forgive someone is to remember the, it differently. That is complete forgiveness. For if you are God, you can remember something differently. Your imagination is God. 
but he is reminding us to revise on a regular basis and to practice an activity that as I have undertaken, it kind of keeps you on your life track. You have an argument or something pops up or something happens to you. If you are regularly every night before you go to bed revising your day and imagining it as if it would have happened, even though that thing happened and you may see effects of it the next day, they seem to be minimized and your response to it is different. As I've said in other episodes, you know, you have an argument with somebody and then you go to bed and you, and, and you wake up angry about something. If you, if you go to bed and revise it so that you didn't argue, when you wake up, you will respond to that person in a different way. And ultimately, the argument goes away. So start revising every day. Check out my meditation on how to, how to feel from the wish fulfilled. And it's a sleep meditation. And you can do that. And I'll, I'll start to create some different revision sleep meditations. Because it is a very powerful thing. And it can be very powerful. Even if you want to go farther back. And do some revisions. Use your strange imagination. And turn the great wheel backward. Until Troy on burns. Is what he's saying. I know a lady who burned her hand. And then unburned it. He says. She poured boiling water on her hand. She lay on the couch and tried to undo mentally what had been done. It was difficult because of the pain, but she kept trying. She redid the scene and poured the boiling water on the tea and brewed it and then she drank the tea. And she did it over and over and finally in the act of thus, making the tea, she fell asleep. And when she awoke some hours later, there was no trace of the burn. She wrote, you would have thought I I should go right to the hospital, but now there is not even a sign of the burn. The past and the present are in one great moment. You have now been given the art of dying. We're not talking about death here. We're really talking about letting go of the past, breaking up those routines. If you continue to do the same things that you're doing now, you're going to continue to get the same things that you have now. I have people I talk to everywhere out there that struggle with certain manifestations or are not having the success that they want. And one of the first questions I would ask is how much different is your new habits? What are you doing that's recurring? The most powerful form of reality creation is identity shifting. When you shift your identity, You're shifting something that's fundamental about you that reverberates on many different layers of your reality. Many times, your very first thought, your actions are all defined by your identity. If you have an identity as a rap artist, you're going to listen to music differently than if you have an identity as a gospel singer. And so your identity is your filter, and it's also the filter of the power coming out of you. That identity needs to die if you want a change. For you to create your new identity and enter and act out and imagine a new reality, you have to let go of the past reality. And sometimes the letting go of the past reality is the harder part than the imagining and moving in to the new reality. Because you're sacrificing things that you may have enjoyed. There's big changes that you're making in relationships and friendships, locations, actions, activities, so many different things change. The hardest is when you don't know what you want to do. And so you don't know what parts need to die. So many people out there have a deep desire to achieve or experience something. And that is really all I want to help people do. I want to tell you that there is magic and you can do this. 
And this is the example of the most effective magic and why all the magic works because you have the magic in you because you are all powerful. And we just are waking up to this power that we have now. And in order for you to wake up to this power, you need to let the other part of you that didn't have the power, the other part of you needs to die. And in that death, we learn the art of dying. It's always a joy to share these beautiful lectures with you. And welcome to the Reality Revolution.